All right, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. I'm Betsy Dalton from the Department of Communication Studies. Um, and I'm wondering if anyone has ever in your taught a class where you heard from students the question of, why do I need to know this? <laughs> How is this going to help me? How is this going to help me get a job? Um, and today what we're here to talk about with our panelists is helping students sort of make that connection between the things that we're teaching and then the skills that employers are looking for. You know, if we're being honest, I think uh, when we look at MTSU students, most of them, they're here with uh, the interest of getting the best job that they can and improving their uh, you know, economic standing or going to graduate school. Um, but it's not always obvious in certain classes what skills are transferable. But we hear that we have some people who are doing that really well from the College of Basic and Applied Sciences and also from the College of Liberal Arts. So I'll just go down the line here and introduce folks. Um, we have Dr. Melissa Lobegeyer, an associate professor in the Department of Geosciences, who's been here since 2006. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Michelle Chappelle, who is unretired for us today. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, mathematics and education. Yes, You've been here for 18 years or so? Uh, here for 18 years. Okay. Yes. Uh, next, Dr. Amy Phelps, who is a professor in the Department of Chemistry, has been here since 2001. <laughs> So that's our basic and applied sciences half. And then over in the CLA half, we have Dr. John Maynard, who is a professor in the Department of Political Science, been here since 04. Dr. Jeff Gibson, who's the chair of the Department of Theater and Dance, who's been with us. Mr. Uh, yeah. Mr. Since 2002, he's yeah. been here. And then Dr. Rebecca King, newly associate professor uh, in Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies, been with us since 2013. Um, we heard some really interesting things. We had an HR panel yesterday for students. I don't know if any of you were able to stop by that. Um, and they were talking about um, these were professionals in uh, HR in different sectors and of government and uh, industry who um, talked about things like the importance of likability to getting hired, which was interesting. I don't know if that's something that can be taught. Um, talked about the ability to do what we in comm studies would call like code switching, being able to communicate to um, different types of people on an intercultural level, different levels of, you know, formality and things like that. So in addition to that, we have this handout we passed around from the World Economic Forum, looking at changes in sort of what um, employers are looking for from 2015 to upcoming 2020. Those have been some um, interesting additions and then some shifts in sort of the desirable job skills. Um, so that's sort of the backdrop for what we will be talking about today. And um, Melissa has to leave a bit early, so she's going to start us off. Okay, thank you. So I'm going to start by talking about one of the classes I'm teaching this semester, um, which is the class for which I have to leave early. So I actually <laughs> have a class fair. this afternoon. So, um, but I teach a class called Invertebrate Paleontology. So it's a five credit hour required class. Um, for students who are in the, I'm in the Department of Geosciences, so students who are in our geology career track. These are basically students who want to become professional geologists or at least want to go to grad school, perhaps to go into an academic career. So we actually have six hours of class time, but I do not teach this as a traditional lecture lab class. I just talk about some stuff, then we, we do a practical assignment on that. And we also have a weekend long field trip to Western Tennessee to collect fossils. And that's for a class assignment. So I'm sure everyone here knows what paleontology is. <laughs> and as I always tell my students, unfortunately, it does not really involve much in the way of dinosaurs. It's not quite as exciting as this, particularly invertebrate paleontology, <laughs> which just deals with muscles and clams and stuff like that. They're not really jumping out and attacking us. So, and 
I was taught paleontology is something that was very focused on the anatomy of the organisms. You get to say the word anus a lot, because apparently it's very important in every group. And then you had to learn all the different names and all the, the species names for everything. But paleontology is actually very theoretical as well, which is the way I try and teach it. So, and try and address some, some of the bigger questions, things about evolution, mass extinction, climate change, all that sort of stuff that we can actually use fossils to talk about. And I actually teach this class as an MT Engage class. So I try and bring in that students should be thinking about how they can make connections between invertebrate paleontology and the other classes that they're working on, how they can transfer their knowledge, both what we learn in the classroom to the stuff that they'll see when we go on our field trip, and also transfer that knowledge when they then go on to take other classes. And also we focus a lot on communication and reflection. So, and a lot of what I'm going to be talking about today actually comes from a big summit that was held at, it was the University of um, Texas in Austin. Back in, two, in 2014, they spo NSF sponsored a summit that brought together a bunch of folks from different um, institutions as well as some industry people and some people from professional geoscience societies to talk about the future of undergraduate geoscience education because right now we're facing a future shortage of qualified geoscientists and they wanted to really focus on what content competencies and skills undergraduates need to be successful, whether they choose to just go into the workforce or whether they choose to go on to graduate school. So that got those of us in our department thinking about these things, particularly for something like invertebrate paleontology. There is not a lot of career opportunity as a paleontologist, I hate to say that, but it's true. So most people who do take my class, a required class, are not going to become paleontologists. So what I try and focus on when I teach this class is the desired characteristics that employers want for geosciences students. And these, were, these came from a big survey that the summit did with a bunch of geoscience employers. And these are the things that came up most often. The ability to communicate effectively. Critical thinking and analytical reasoning. The ability to solve complex problems. Teamwork skills. The ability to innovate and be creative. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen these things before. The ability to locate, organize, and evaluate information from multiple sources. And the ability to work with numbers and understand statistics. So these are things that I think employers are looking at whether someone's graduating from CBAS or from liberal arts in most cases. Maybe not the statistics in some cases in liberal arts, but maybe I just, I'm sure in some parts of liberal arts it is still very important. So this is all stuff that any of our students should be able to manage. So. I talk about ways that I will give students these skills as well as them learning how to recognize a bivalve from a brachiopod. <laughs> so, and these are, these are slides that I actually show my students in our introductory paleontology class. So I tell them that every week, I tell them the topics we're going to cover that week, the learning outcomes and skills they will gain, and in these cases, in this case, many of those skills are things that employers desire. And then obviously we do the due dates for the week and I tell them that they should be able to complete the work if they effectively manage their class time. I give them a lot of time in class to work on our assignments. So an example is from week one where we had assignments every day but varying levels of complexity and then I go through the skills. So assignment one was very simple. It was just calculating percentages and doing a little bit of data analysis. By the time we got to assignment three, what we were starting to talk about taphonomy and biostratonomy, 
I don't know if any of you folks know that, but it's to do with how fossils get preserved. So, but then they would also be working in groups. So they would be getting teamwork skills. They would have to manage their time, which comes under project management. They would be problem solving because I, I was giving them a bunch of real fossils and they had to work out in what sort of environment those fossils were preserved. And they would have to evaluate information from source material, which I gave them. And then they had to write a paper. So that's written communication. So I was trying to give them a lot of different skills in this one small assignment. And then, for example, assignment five was a little different. In this case, we used Excel, and we used something called PAST, which is paleontological statistics software. So often they say, why are you making me use this software I'm never going to use again? And it's like, well, when you're employed, your employer may give you a software package specific to the company. You're going to have to work out how to use it. So this is what we're practicing here, using different software packages. And I've actually done, since we did these assignments, I have done some reflections with my students. They actually said the use of Excel and PAST were the most valuable skills they've gained so far this semester, particularly Excel, which is something they're going to have to use in a lot of classes. And then obviously it's MT Engage. So I get them to put examples of the different assignments onto their e-portfolio to demonstrate that they have, in fact, learned those skills. And then they do an overall reflection on how they think they can take those skills and use them in future classes and which of those skills they think may benefit them in the future, either in graduate school or in the workforce. So, that's that class, but I teach several other classes. So I'm still working on how to tie these classes into that framework more effectively, particularly with Introduction to Earth Science, which is the Gen Ed science class I teach. So, and in fact, this uh, workshop prompted me to have a discussion with my students in 10.30 this morning about why I want them to learn plate tectonics and why that might help them in the future. <laughs> so, I'm not sure they believed me, but still a valuable <laughs> conversation to have with them. But I think it's introduction to earth science. I think it's important for everyone to know about the earth that we live on. So I should probably stress the relevancy to them a little bit more than I, I currently do. but. I do do that more when we get into climate change and things like that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to talk about right now. I don't know if we have time for questions or... Well, we'll probably do it in the end. Okay. Thank you. Do you want to talk next? Um, no one else. I think I'm going to. Okay. All right. Well, hello, everyone. And um, thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Pat. <laughs> Even though I didn't know at the time we had breakfast, Pat asked me to do this. I'm like, mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, so I'll just stand here because my comments are pretty much uh, my notes uh, on my notes here. And I, I was reflecting on this the other day, and I thought, uh, you know, I can thank our field. I'm in mathematics education and have been there in that area for 38 years. And um, I think I feel recognized a long time ago that we needed to do something to get students into liking math better because we often got that question, when am I ever going to use this, you know? I didn't get it as much at the college level, but certainly when I taught high school, we would often get that question and we, some of us have probably asked that question <laughs> as well. And so I have to thank our field, uh, our National Council of Mathematics, Teachers of Mathematics, uh, even the science field, NARST or um, I think I'm saying it right. right? You're all saying it. Yeah, oh, okay. <laughs> that feel, because we've studied this issue a lot. So how do we get these skill, these skill sets, and how do we uh, help students to understand that mathematics is a part of their everyday lives, science is a part of their everyday lives. So even some of these skills that you see on that sheet there that I'm assuming everyone has, 
you know, the, the, the complex problem solving, uh, critical thinking, those are our big buzzwords in our field. And they have been for a long time. Um, one of the first set of standards that came out in the late 80s when I worked with the organization really, really up close and personal, you know, that was a big thing to talk about problem solving as not just something you did in the classroom, but as a process for thinking. And so communication became a process, making connections became a process, problem solving was a process, you know, and even as they came out with the latter part of the standards in 2000, you know, they added some things like representation and how we tend to represent things. And all of those things were really just to get students engaged in the classroom and not be, feels like they were so remotely uh, uh, distant from learning mathematics. And, and it still is critical. Those are still our buzzwords. You know, if you go in anybody's classroom at the college level, particularly my colleagues who are my former colleagues here, you're gonna hear these same kinds of things, you know, negotiating, problem solving uh, uh, strategies. Or whatever. These are these are, and I don't. When I say buzzwords, I don't mean that they just talk about them without really following up with some kind of activity. So we have we have really struggled with this in our field and our discipline to make these things a part of what students understand about mathematics because they're going out to teach, and we want them to teach with these ideas, teach with a problem solving approach, teach for critical thinking, teach for understanding that you have to negotiate when you're working on a team with people. You know, teach for, and I was fascinated by some of these um, skills that either went up or down from, you know, 2015 now to 2020 almost. And I thought, hmm, that's kind of interesting, like coordinating with others, you know, that tended to go down or managing people or whatever. And then, of course, uh, some of them came up. You know, creativity, that's a big area right now in being creative. And how do you be creative? Now, it's interesting because my theater buddy over here, I have a background in theater. And so for years, we've been told that, oh, you're left brain, right brain kind of thing. And, and I, I always think, well, where does that put me? Because I, I have a background in theater. I switched over in college and did my math stuff and have done that for 38 years, loved it and whatnot, and still picking back up my theater stuff. But it's like, well, where does that put me? And so we, 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 sep we make students feel like they're separated some kind of way. And that's just so false because you want them to be creative in their thinking when they're in the classroom. And so this, this struggle that we had as a discipline, you know, we really have been thinking through this for some, I don't know, 20, 30 years or so. I mean, it's just gone on and on and on. It's probably not gonna go away, okay? So we're still trying to deal with how do we make students uh, be flexible in their thinking? Because, you know, for mathematics, everybody wants to, oh, it's all about rules, it's all about, you know, right or wrong, and that kind of, and some things are about right or wrong. I'm not trying to throw that out the window, but you have to be creative, and you have to be flexible in your thinking. Um, and so I've, I've tried to, over the years, use a lot of uh, things that I've learned at conferences. You know, I said, okay, I'm going to this conference, the universities have paid for us to go to these conferences, and you stay a week, you invest, you know, a whole lot of time at a lot of conferences. <laughs> We've been to a lot of conferences <laughs> over the years. And, and had a lot of fun at conferences. But I think it was around when I was, uh, prior to being here for 18 years, I was at the University of South Florida, and about midway there, I decided, you know what, I'm gonna take some of these activities that we're doing at the conferences, and I'm gonna create activities that I want to do in my classroom. So for example, uh, you, if, I know if you go to something like AERA, we used to go to AERA, or even NCTM now, and they have these, what we call the round table mm -hmm. uh, sessions. You, everybody's attended those round table sessions where you just kind of go to a session, you sit, and you talk with someone, and then you go to another a round table, and you talk with someone, and you keep doing that. I said, well, I could do that in my problem solving class. Yeah. And so, and it was a graduate problem solving class, and I've done it now in undergraduate classes and whatnot, because you just take the same activity and kind of vary it a little bit, because, I mean, it's a lot of stuff to think about over the years, so you don't want to keep reinventing the wheel. So I did that, and I would have stations. I just had, sta like in a classroom, I'd have stations uh, set up, and I'd have different problems set up at those stations, and I was teaching a grad class of teachers at this particular time uh, out of St. Pete, uh, Florida, and uh, so I'd have them that for about an hour we just do round robin problem solving and they just go to these different stations and solve problems together 
because they would do it in groups. And I'd ring the bell when it was time to move, and they'd go, and I'm like, wait, I'm not finished. Well, sorry, you gotta move on, you know, that kind of thing. So I started thinking about how can I use these, some of these approaches that we use for conference sessions, if you will, and create an activity around it uh, when you're, you know, to, be, to make students more engaged in the classroom. And one of the big ones that I have used over the last few years that I really, really got a lot out of, and the students have gotten a lot out of, uh, at least based on what they told me, and it was more primarily in a graduate setting, but I, I had worked on several different panels for um, yearbook panels, publication panels, you know, uh, review panels, all kinds of different panels. And I said, well, you know, it would be interesting if when we started our doctoral program, we had a class on journal writing and what that process was all about. So I taught a seminar in that, and I thought, man, it would really be interesting for students to learn what that whole journal process is about. Because when you're first writing, when you're first learning how to write, you don't know what is on the other side. You just know what you have to do on this side. But there's a whole lot of stuff that goes on on the other side of the table in terms of taking your article, you know, what do you call it, distributing out to the view, uh, to the reviewers, what that process is like, and what does it look like. And so I said, well, I've got to figure out a way to incorporate that into this seminar. And so it took me a couple of iterations to get it like I really wanted it. And so, so basically that's what we do. I have students write their papers, First of all, we would do it for, we would actually take someone's <coughs> work, someone's pre-published work, and I'd have to call on my colleagues and say, hey, if you've had an article published in, <laughs> in this journal, can, do you mind sending me your pre-published work so that we can read that and review that and then read your published work later on? So it took a little bit of, you know, uh, uh, all of that kind of back drop work to get that done. But that experience for my doc students said, man, this was really, really interesting. This was really good because they have a lot of questions about that process, like we all did. You know, when you're first starting to write, you're like, oh, I don't know, and then your first thing, and you get the rejection, and everybody's like, ah, you know, you're all upset about that, but you don't understand what that process is like for the most part. And so they said, well, what is this thing about all of the different um, rejection levels that you can go through and all of the different acceptances and what does it mean to revise and accept or or what do we get is the revi revision major level revision, minor Ma revision. yeah major revision and minor revision that just has so many questions about that process that we had to sort of work ourselves through when we um, when we started this activity and so as it turned out uh, we went through that several times, and uh, so in this, in my graduate, in my, uh, I'm trying to think, my master's graduate level class, I started incorporating that review panel process for part of their papers. So here they're, they've got to write this major paper, and I said, okay, well, we're going to have two sessions of a review so that each student serves as a reviewer and each student obviously is writing. And so they get, so everybody has an opportunity to review everyone's work while that person is, is, out, of, is out of the room. I have done it where they were in the room and it's, it's too hard because a lot of times people can't take hearing people talk about your work. So I figured that that's a little unnerving, so just, just yeah. let you go. Because in, in actuality, you're not at the table anyway when someone's reviewing your work. So I had to kind of think through that process. And so... I think it just taught this class last spring or fall or sometime, and, um, and we did it again. I had like eight or so students, and they were master's and doctoral level students, and we their final papers, we went through that process of reviewing them, having, I call it, a panel review. And they write up the, uh, the synopsis of what we talk about while that person is out. They come back and they give that to the student, and it's supposed to help them to revise and go through and getting sending, submitting a better document at, at the end. And so those kinds of things are things that I have done over the years to make that engagement more meaningful for students. And um, that's, I like that. I, it's just been very beneficial for me. And so I'll stop there and thank you. Thank you. Okay, so here we go. <laughs> All right. Thank <laughs> you.
So I thought we were supposed to talk about sort of how we do things, so we're going to do things how I sort of do things. <laughs> so here's the deal. So um, I teach chemistry, and I teach general chemistry, and almost nobody asks me why they have to be in the class. It's required. That's why. So nobody asks me that. They do often ask me, why are you doing it this way? Um, I didn't sign up to teach myself this class. Sorry, dude. I don't like working with other people. Sorry, dude. Um, <laughs> so in my class, this the, the activities and what are they go in a folder like this. This folder is for four people, usually three to five, usually four. Four people. They have activities in them because it makes it a whole lot easier than passing out papers the way I'm about to. <laughs> <laughs> I can see why I use those. Uh, let's see. We'll see. Make sure. I, I got it. I got it. Okay. I have a lot of energy. I have to blow it off. Yes. <laughs> There's a bunch there. Sure. Hey, how are you doing? Yeah, me too. Um, anybody? I'm going to have to skip somebody. All right. So I know y'all didn't sign up to do chemistry today. Wait a minute. I'm going to leave my friends up. <laughs> I feel like I left somebody else up. That's all right. I'm oh, here. That one's loose. Okay. So you didn't sign up to do chemistry. I brought you something you ought to be able to do. No chemistry required. Okay. <laughs> so the, the way I organize these activities, or I try to organize these activities, is that um, you provide some information and you see if students working together can come up with a pattern. Can you recognize a pattern? Can you write your own rules? And one of the problems we have in chemistry is students don't understand this concept of significant digits or significant figures. Um, and they really don't know how to deal with zeros and significant figures. So this is, so, so the really fast, I'm gonna use this word wrong, efficient way for me to do this is to write the rules on the board, okay? Or maybe send them to the textbook and tell them to read the rules. These do not work. I can tell you they do not work. I got lots of years of experience, we won't say how many, um, for them not working. So this is an activity that I do with my class. Um, they're, like I said, in groups of four inside their folder. Um, there's a sticky note that tells them their jobs. This is the people in this group. This is an actual folder for my class. This is people in this group and their jobs. If they forget what their job is, there's a piece of paper that reminds them what that job is supposed to do. The jobs are things like manager, presenter, reflector, I forgot one, a recorder, that's it. So um, in the folder, there's one of these for every student in the group and an extra one. The extra one is the one you fill out with your group answers that comes back to me every day in the folder so that I sort of know how your group is doing. There's also a blank piece of paper for the reflector to go, we blew up, this is terrible, oh my gosh, whatever that the reflector wants to say to me. Um, can you please move this person out of our group? Um, whatever they want to say to me. So if you'll just take just a minute, yes, they do, they do say that, in just a minute, with the people around you, I don't have time to give you jobs, I'm so sorry. Um, I'm doing it wrong. Um, but um, if you take it just a minute, you see that there's, there's, a set of, there's a set of examples at the bottom. And from this, your job would be to write rules. And you don't have to know anything about chemistry to try and find the pattern in why the number of significant figures is what it is. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> okay, a minute. I'll give you a whole minute. I'm going to I try and tell them. Doesn't matter if you're from the Doesn't matter if you're the theater. I hear patterns, I hear patterns, patterns are good. Yeah, 
All right. I bet you can all at least find one pattern for one set, right? You all are really smart. You have advanced degrees and stuff, right? I mean, you, you're really a very skilled student. Um, so, so my students in their groups, I, I, we're gonna bring. What's your name, sir? Mike. We're gonna bring Mike to my class. He's just gonna tell them all how the rules work because that was he had it. He was on it. Hey, I can see what this. Is. So then they have to turn it over and they have to write the rules. Okay. And so instead of me writing the rules or me writing the rules on uh, the board or on a PowerPoint or somewhere else. They write the rules, okay? Now, this is all in the context of going to lab and making measurements and all kinds of other stuff that we're doing. But the idea is that they've negotiated some meaning, hopefully, um, and, and then tried to communicate that. And then they share their rules on great big giant whiteboards with the other groups. And we see, do the rules match? Yes, they match. Or, um, oh, your rule doesn't seem to have the right qualifier in it. Or how come ours are different? And then we do some examples to see if indeed we have the rules. Now this is a really, really short activity that I would do in my class. This would take maybe, well, with my class, maybe 20 minutes or so. And you're like, yeah, but you could have written those three rules on the board, lickety split, keep moving. Yes, and they still wouldn't know what to do with them, so that's awesome. Right. That's why I used this one I said efficient a minute ago. Yes, it's very efficient for me to lecture. I can lecture really, really fast, and I can talk really, really fast, and it doesn't make any difference at all. So. Um, and I love the sound of my own voice, but um, <laughs> there's other activities like this, this one that they're about to do tomorrow, that will be on for a week. You know, it's five pages and there's tables and tables of data. So to the students I say, yes, you're right. You got to work in groups because that's just the way the world is. You got to negotiate. We, we rotate. We rotate roles, so everybody has to be the presenter, everybody has to be the manager, everybody has to be the reflector. Um, and I always tell them, I said, you know, I write a lot of letters of recommendation. It's kind of what I do, apparently. This is my other part of my job. And there's no place on the workload for this, uh, but I just yeah. like to say. Um, but the people who get these letters do not want to know what grade they got in my class. They already have their transcript. They don't want to know that. So I actually have something I can talk about. I can talk about how they worked in groups, whether they were good leaders or not, or whether they got along with different people. Um, anyway, so that's seven. I'm good. I'm out. <laughs> Now, liberal arts will get their time. <laughs> so my, my children all have their degrees over here, so I am. <laughs> they stole all my kids. One fine arts, one liberal arts. Don't know. Philosophy, really? Yes. Okay, so uh, I'm John Maynard. I work in the uh, Department of Political Science and International Relations. Thank you very much for having me here. Um, my path into academia was one of those uh, somewhat winding roads where I often straddled uh, being a student and working. Uh, as an undergraduate in Mississippi, I worked at the Mississippi Secretary of State's office uh, all three years that I was an undergraduate. And then when I was uh, uh, doing my master's degree, I uh, managed to get a job with a, a member of the House of Representatives from Mississippi. And so I worked uh, in Congress uh, for a while until my boss, uh, uh, who was the congressman from Mississippi, became uh, Bill Clinton's Secretary of Agriculture, uh, which was a great moment for me because it meant that I got to move over into the administration as a political appointee. Uh, and at the Department of Agriculture, I spent three years working in the Department of uh, intergovernmental affairs, eventually becoming the director of the Office of Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, I then spent one year as a special assistant to 
the uh, Assistant Secretary for the Food and Nutrition Service. And for those of you that don't know the Department of Agriculture, they actually do very little agriculture. Uh, they do, uh, their biggest programs are uh, uh, food stamp program, school lunch program, and WIC. So I worked on these issues for uh, a year until I figured out that I needed to flee the country so that I could go back to school. Uh, and I actually did flee the country and I went to England uh, where I was living for uh, almost 10 years uh, before coming here. So I approach my classes uh, with this same uh, kind of attitude that uh, academic study and real world work is a partnership. And I stress to my students that um, it's not about what you know, but it's what you can do. And what you've got to do for me is to demonstrate uh, certain competencies, uh, and that these competencies are going to be the ones that serve you after you leave MTSU, whatever you go do. A lot of our students in our department uh, think they're going to law school. Um, many of them do go to law school, but some of them don't. But I always tell them, at some point, whether or not you go to law school or not, you're going to have to get a job, and you're going to have to work in an office environment. And so what I try to do in my classes is to recreate moments of my working in an office in the hopes that it will help them develop certain competencies. And so what I... Um, try to do is, uh, sorry, go back, <laughs> is uh, stress um, something which some of you may be familiar with, uh, which is put out by the career uh, services offices. That they call them Raider Ready Skills, um, and I'll show those in a minute. In my senior level class, I have a uh, pretty much a two-week unit uh, which I call Career Readiness Boot Camp, where we, we focus on career readiness issues, which I'll go over. And then uh, I'm going to show you some coursework uh, examples. So let's talk about uh, the Raider Ready uh, competencies. So um, these are competencies that were developed by the uh, National Association of College and Employers. And uh, they basically um, are uh, skill sets that employers want. And so what I typically will do at the beginning of the semester, and mind you, this is a, a, a senior level class called Senior Seminar, um, is I sit down with the students individually and we talk about what these competencies are. And I, I tr try to identify things that they have done that might contribute to the competency, but I also try to identify things they haven't done so that we can stress those in the class so that they can then say to an employer, yeah, I have that competency because I did this in my class. Um, so we then move on to uh, the boot camp. And the boot camp has typically uh, three parts to it. Uh, the first is I invite uh, the Career Center over and they have a, a, a class visit and basically this is your normal, you know, what are the resources here on campus? They talk to them about interviews, uh, job search strategies, and also, uh, which I find very important, workplace etiquette. Uh, because a lot of students uh, while they're in school, they're not necessarily doing an office job. They're doing other kinds of jobs, and they have no idea how to behave in an office. <laughs> and this, in this day and age, is incredibly important that you have uh, mutual respect for your colleagues, and you behave, and you act in a professional manner. Um, and I find that students really need to be told this uh, up front, because I see how they behave in the class. Um, the next thing we do is uh, all of the students take uh, these uh, uh, assessments, the MBTI and the strong interests. Um, normally, the career folks will tell you that they, people should be taking this in their first or second year. Um, and they should. But at the same time, a lot of the students haven't. 
And uh, what I find is um, these uh, uh, assessments are very valuable, not necessarily because they're going to tell these students what type of career to go into, but what they are going to do is let the students know uh, how they work best, what type of environment they should be looking for when they think about moving into a job. Um, and I told them, I said, look, I'm not going to ask you to do anything that I haven't done. So I took the test along with them, and what the career center does is they come and they do a class exercise where um, they demonstrate all of the different uh, personality types, and, and it's a really fun day. We, we get segregated into whether we're an E or an N or all this stuff, and uh, students really enjoy it because it, it gives them some insight into how they process the world. And if you know how you process the world, then you can uh, make decisions based on that. Um, and I find that uh, they really enjoy uh, you know, figuring out uh, how they think and how they work and then trying to match that up with maybe career choices or employers who would reflect that, who will allow them to be the best, best version that they can be. Um, the other thing that we do is I make them prepare a job search uh, ready resume. And students will always tell you, oh yeah, I've got a resume. Uh, <laughs> and the thing is, that's fine, but is it job search ready? That's what I need to know. So. They do an exercise where, again, they work with the Career Center, uh, and they are required to go through the process of uh, revision and evaluation before they make this resume. And then, if I can get them to apply for jobs while they're in class, then that's even better. Uh, I've had students apply for jobs, get interviews, and then you know we, we can kind of go through the whole uh, process. Um, so here are some uh, coursework uh, examples. So let me back up a little bit. So the senior seminar class is not only about careers. It's full of political science content. We do take a two-week block in the middle to talk about careers, but throughout the course, uh, we are uh, learning material and doing exercises. And we're doing exercises which mimic exercises that a, uh, a political science student might do in a career. And so uh, we do a lot of group work, uh, which of course drives them crazy. But again, it's how the world works now. Uh, they do um, a lot of uh, presentations uh, in, in, in front of people. They do collaborative writing, um, and I've got a uh, couple examples that I wanted to just demonstrate to you because I know people like to have their hands on stuff. Um, one of the things that I had to do a lot in my career, uh, in my other job, was create uh, one-pagers for my boss. Uh, often, my boss would come to me and say, hey, I'm going to a meeting, and uh, I don't know anything about this meeting. Um, I need to look like an expert. And typically a boss, or my boss, would have a car ride to uh, transform himself into an expert. And so what this would consist of is, is one of the staffers, me, uh, you know, taking uh, a topic and boiling it down into uh, a one-page uh, document that would be kind of useful. And if I can get this to work, how do you switch? Uh, it's on now. Yeah. Oh, okay. There's usually a little screen in our classroom. Nobody knows how to do this. Okay. I can hold it up. He's coming. So, a lot of times uh, when we first do this assignment, I'll get something like this, which you can see is an awful one-pager. Your boss is going to look at that and they're going to throw it away because it's not very useful. So this will be the student's first cut and they'll turn it in after I get through with them into something that looks a little bit more like that. 
which is much more user friendly. Uh, it's direct, it's written in sound bites. We all know politicians like sound bites because they, they speak in sound bites, so they want to be talked to uh, in that way. Um, so this is an a, uh, assignment that they do uh, twice a semester. They do a first cut where I kind of leave them alone, and then they do a second cut where I uh, give them some constructive uh, feedback and talk to them about uh, how they could do it better. Uh, another kind of assignment that I do is, uh, and this is in a different class, uh, I also teach a human rights class, is I make them do briefing books. Um, and um, one of the other jobs that I had was to uh, prepare briefing books for my boss. And similar to the car ride, the boss would normally have a plane ride in which to become an expert on an issue which they didn't know anything about. So there's an art to making a book uh, about that, and I can uh, pass some of these examples out, and you can uh, see what our students have uh, kind of been up to. <coughs> so in the book, uh, typically would have an executive summary, which would be the only piece of material that the students actually write themselves. Much of the book would be source material, mm -hmm. and um, something like a frequently asked question or something like that. Um, the books need to be uh, aesthetically pleasing and easy to use uh, on an airplane um, or in a car or, or, or whatever. Um, and typically students really like this assignment because uh, one, it's not just a boring old essay that they have to write, and two, they do most of it from the internet. <laughs> because really they're just simply going online, looking at source material, yeah. and printing it out. Yeah. Uh, but there's an art to it in knowing what good source material is, how to organize it, how to contextualize it, what parts are, 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 are the most important, uh, and what parts are uh, perhaps best left out of the book. Um, so, just to sum up then, in my classes what I try to do is bring actual uh, examples from work that I had done in the past, um, and I keep the content uh, focused on the subject matter, say political science or human rights, but the coursework exercises come in the uh, vein of these real-world uh, examples so that students develop those competencies and can point to concrete examples of what they have done. Um, and my hope is that they leave MTSU more prepared than the guy in the resume stack next to them so that they can say, I have not only learned how to do something, I have done something, and I can demonstrate a competency in it. So that's my approach. I'm going to jump right in, because uh, we are a little bit short on time. Um, and I prepared remarks so that I would stay uh, really uh, tight, because I can talk about this subject for a really long time, as Lucy and others uh, know. So forgive me for uh, speaking from a script, uh, being the theater guy. Um, I'll start by saying that uh, I think a lot of what our students learn through their theater training is very valuable in a variety of careers. Certainly um, valuable to their work in uh, the future theater and, and entertainment industry, but also valuable in uh, any kind of field that values communication, uh, collaboration, creative thinking. I could go on and on. Uh, so, having noted this, um, I believe it is very important for, for us in our program to, certainly we educate students in the artistry. That's, that's a given, right, uh, and, and a certainty. But I also think that um, we should help our students to become employable as they leave the university, and this often means being employable in a second uh, field um, as well. 
uh, even if that's outside of their, uh, their primary field, because one of the realities of our industry is that um, full employment is sometimes a challenge, especially for young artists uh, to gain full employment. So our students are asked to uh, self-reflect and create a personal inventory of transferable skills. And I'll talk how we do this in a moment. Um, but this is used to um, identify what I affectionately refer to, and my students probably hate, as uh, thrival jobs, as opposed to survival jobs. And by this, I mean that uh, I, I try to help my students understand how they can utilize the many skills that they've developed through their theater training, even if uh, the work uh, their employment is outside of the field of theater. So I also encourage them to, to develop employability in these thrival areas during their time as a student through things like elective coursework uh, that they can pursue through uh, additional minors that they can include in their degree program, um, internships and other practical kinds of development experiences. So we start advising on that and actually instructing on that in their first year seminar in theater during their first semester in our program. And we continue that conversation with them primarily through advising uh, the entire time they're a student. So one of the ways that I ask them to reflect on their soft skills is uh, I use a, a quick survey instrument where I ask them to rate uh, their perception of their strength on the skills that are listed there. And they can also add skills to that if they wish as well. Once they've completed that, then we have a discussion in class and, and often separately as well about how they may have developed those skills through their theater training or other work uh, that they've done on campus or, or even off campus. And, um, and then I ask them to reflect uh, with me on how those may be applicable to other kinds of uh, career opportunities for them. I just, just did this last week, by the way, in my senior seminar class, and the students uh, noted that they feel confident that they possess strength in coordinating with others, active listening, judgment and decision making, organization and time management. So once they've gone through that process, <clears throat> uh, they then start to identify specific thrival jobs as a part of the senior seminar class. Uh, they're often somewhat innovative in this, sometimes a little um, out there in that process. But I have uh, found that some of them uh, certainly need help and connecting their skills to potential jobs outside of their primary career of theater. I found that the Career Shift uh, job search engine, which is on the MTSU's Career Center website, is sometimes helpful to them. It's a job search aggregator, and they can plug in their uh, skills and perhaps even their interests and do a search and see what pops up then they can click on a specific job and look at um, uh, you know, the job description so they understand more about that position and also what uh, folks may be looking for in candidates for those kinds of positions as well. So in our senior seminar, all of our students, uh, actually they start in first year seminar and finish in senior seminar developing industry standard resumes for an actor, a designer, whatever their, their passion uh, career is. But they also have to develop a specific thrival uh, job resume and cover letter as well. And the Career Center folks are great about helping with that process. They come and present to the class on that. And there's also a Dropbox feature uh, where they can give students um, uh, feedback on that. So my goal in all of that really is for them to develop an understanding of, of what their skills are and the, how they can be applicable in a variety of, of different fields uh, in theater and outside of theater. Uh, how to identify specific jobs 
that they can pursue now or uh, possibly in the future, and then how they can actually go about the task of applying for and gaining employment in those fields as well. Um, I'm going to skip my, uh, <laughs> my last part because it uh, gets us into a whole new discussion on applied <laughs> theater. Uh, so. I also have notes and a PowerPoint because I was hoping to keep myself on time. Um, I recognize we are past the hour though, so if there are people who need to take off, um, my feelings won't be hurt. So please feel free to do so. All right. Um, so I want to begin by thanking Dr. Dalton for coordinating this and thanking the College of Basic and Applied Sciences, the College of Liberal Arts, and our deans, uh, Dr. Fisher and Dr. Peterson, um, whose support of faculty and students across the university is beyond compare. Um, I want to begin by drawing our attention to these transferable skills so that you have the list in front of you. But, so we can see them up here. Um, and first and foremost, I want to say that I'm pretty sure that everyone who has made time to come to this event is probably already doing a lot of these things in your classrooms. Um, one of the great things about teaching at MTSU is that it is a student-centered, <coughs> learner-centered institution that values mentorship. So while I'm certainly making use of my judgment and decision making, I am sort of positing that probably a lot of you already have those skill sets in place um, and are really just looking to kind of fine tune how we do this. My own background in understanding how transferable skills comes from sort of a side project that I did as a doctoral student that was unrelated to my research. From 2006 to 2012, I worked for the Continuing and Adult Education School Board Association of the Province of Ontario. Um, and this was a government-funded agency that had many different branches and responsibilities. So skill number five there, coordinating with others. Uh, and most related to our topic was that during the recession in 2008, we were tasked with finding ways for people who were wanting to return to either high school or college, finding ways that they could uh, kind of look at their, what they've already learned, do a prior learning assessment, and determine what skills they already had coming into a college setting and what skills they needed to develop while they were in college. So skills number four, people management, and skills number one, complex problem solving. Um, so from this experience, I would say that one of the most important concerns for us is articulation. Um, we need to learn to do this in terms of clearly delineating the importance of transferable skills, what their role is, particularly in our disciplinary complex uh, context, and most importantly, we need to equip our students to both understand and explain what skills they have, why they matter, and how they've gained these skills. Um, and I really think that, uh, I guess I'm a little disappointed, skill number six, emotional intelligence, uh, that this translation of moving ideas from one area to another is not something that's on the list, but I'm sure it would be on the top 25, right? Okay, so I'm gonna begin with some meta-commentary and then move into some more specific uh, topics. So uh, I have a couple of points, and one of, really I think that this is a good way to start because again, one of the key things that we do and want to encourage our students to do is to think about how to move from abstract thinking to uh, more concrete thinking, right? Skill number 10, cognitive flexibility. Okay, so meta-commentary. First, you cannot do this by yourself. Um, the task of integrating these sorts of skills and competencies into our curriculum in a meaningful and a sustained way that will garner results requires work beyond the level of individual classroom exercises, individual courses, and individual faculty. It's something that needs to be happening at both department levels, and uh, it's something that requires an institutional buy-in to an operating logic where faculty from different disciplines are working together um, with shared, although not identical, 
ambitions, goals, and measures. So skill number nine, negotiation. Um, and the good news is, of course, we have that option at MTSU, right? There's a number of programs, MT Engage, faculty learning communities, um, and all of these initiatives are working to help us provide these opportunities. Second major point is that you can and should do this in a way that aligns with your discipline. Um, I don't know whether this is going to feel as imperative to everyone else here, but certainly from my own perspective as a scholar of religion, it's really important that as I'm thinking about what transferable skills I want my students to be gaining in my classroom, that they're doing it in a way that is going to be recognizable to my discipline. So my discipline is a discipline that's primarily about what religious people do and what that doing does. So making sure that I'm always kind of keeping that at the forefront of my mind. And I see some people nodding, so I'm guessing other people feel that way as well. Third, you must know who your students are. Or to quote my mentor, Jean Gallagher, you should love the one you're with. Um, so we have to get to know who our students are and recognize that we need to teach those students, not the students that we wish we had. Um, and we have to understand them as individuals and also as part of a generation. Right? We finally made sense of the sort of entrepreneurial shared economy of the millennials. And lo and behold, millennials have come and gone, and we have this new generation in our freshman classes of the generation Z or Z. Um, so we need to figure out who they are. And to quote another friend of mine who is now an Episcopalian priest, we have to show them how much we care before we can show them how much we know. And uh, that's important because our students are not going to take seriously our discussions about transferable skills until we're able to articulate to them that we value these skills as much as we want them to value the skills. And finally, I think that our focus on transferable skills needs to think beyond careers and needs to think beyond jobs and workplaces. That these are skills that they are gaining that are going to be as important to their work in the community, volunteer activities they may be involved in, their life with their families, and the fact that they are citizens, right? So skill number eight, service orientation. Um, and this is really important, I think, for us especially because, as we all know, our students tend to stay in Middle Tennessee, so this gives us an opportunity to shape not just the workforce in our own communities, but the people and the esprit de corps, I guess, to quote the French. Okay, so moving from there, I want to go into some specifics, since you've now listened to my soapbox. Um, my experience at MTSU is a little bit unique because along with Jenna Gray Hildenbrand, I was hired here in part with the ambition of starting a religious studies major. Um, I always tell people I have the best job in North America because it's been such an amazing experience. Um, so we hit the ground running along with our colleagues in philosophy with support from the College of Liberal Arts uh, Administrative Office and the Provost Office um, and began the pr process of assessing who our students were, and what our institutional needs were. And from the very beginning, it became clear that because of the unique nature of Murfreesboro and where it's located in the world, that our students weren't ready to talk about religion uh, without sort of first undergoing some sort of process of understanding how to talk as scholars um, or from an, an, from an objective sort of perspective as opposed to a personal or devotional one. So the first thing we did was we started this religion and society course that was emphasizing frameworks of objectivity, neutrality, personal reflexivity, and the ability to learn and apply a new system of classification, right, in this context, the academic study of religion, in order to analyze cultural traditions that were not their own. Um, in the religion and society course, which is our general education course, the students conduct research um, in the field where they attend a religious service or ceremony within a tradition other than their own. And uh, they're trained to do so not as tourists, not as people who are shopping around to figure out what religion they should become, um, but as scholars. And so they're asked to take detailed field notes, write a field report, in which they describe the group based on their observations, analyze it using the different theories we've covered in the class, and compose a critical reflective essay. Uh, and so I see this as 
a transferable skill because these abilities to do these things are something that are going to be applicable in a number of different contexts and certainly would be applicable almost directly in some workforce, workforces, but in many cases probably even more indirectly in ways that are going to be really important. Um, and then I obviously, alongside this sort of major project, we do smaller versions of it with case studies, primary text, films, um, news media, and specifically with non-religious examples so that they're really learning these skills that I have in the academic study of religion or from my religious studies course are applicable outside of it. I think in some ways we have kind of the opposite problem because our students are all really excited about religion. Um, as a Canadian, it's sort of shocking how excited they are about religion, but we have to <laughs> convince them that it's not just an exciting, fun thing, but that they're learning skills that they could use elsewhere. Um, so that's part of what I think a lot of our focus then has become is based on wanting to build something that the students are able to see as inherently applicable and outside of religion, because of course they're not going to become religions, right? Um, <laughs> maybe they are, right? Maybe Jeffrey. He's going to start his own. <laughs> right? um, so, in our internship course, for example, we focused our theme around religion and public life. Um, and we specifically have asked students to try to brainstorm or come up with possible internship locations that are going to be sort of outside of traditional religious. Uh, institutions and we've only had three students but uh, one of them was a social media manager for a, for a local church the other ran a religious uh, sort of children's education program and then the third one worked at one of the Tennessee State Parks so trying to really get them to even when they're in religious settings find ways to think about what they're doing there in ways that uses content knowledge or theoretical knowledge from religious studies but in ways that applies it to something other than just more religion. Um, and this is something that we have built into the program design. And again, like I said, one of the things that's been really great about my job is being able to participate in discussions that shaped this program. And uh, so in formulating the major, we had different options available to us, uh, often at a lot of institutions, religious studies majors will offer a course that's an Eastern religions course, a Western religions course, a Bible course, and then a modern world, modern contemporary religions course. Um, and from the perspective of the discipline, there's a number of reasons why that's problematic. It's called the world religions paradigm, and I can explain it afterwards if there are people who have questions. Uh, but it's something that has been sort of pushed back and people are stepping away from in the academic study of religion. And uh, a lot of people have switched to a more methods or theory-based approach to the major, where maybe you'd have to take a course in philosophy, a course in uh, sacred texts or philology, religious history, different sort of approaches to religion. But even that is somewhat problematic and for a number of reasons wasn't going to work in our context. So instead, we integrated what we see as a competency-based program for religious studies. Um, and so notice that I say competencies here and not skills. In research that looks at language acquisitions and literacy skills, there is a difference between what people think of as skills and what people think of as competencies. Uh, skills, for example, literacy would be the ability to read signs and menus, uh, to sort of write birthday cards or letters, and competency speaks to an ability to do something that involves advanced understanding, explanation, interpretation, and critique. So we chose these three competency areas that we see as fundamental to the academic study of religion, but not inherently only for the academic study of religion. So these skill sets of description, analysis, and critique are highlighting different skills that we want them, or different competencies that we want them to take up as they um, are moving through the program. And uh, so they are required to take at least one from each of these areas. Um, uh, so that gives us a way to scaffold a lot of these transferable skills, not only in our individual classes, but across the curriculum. Um, last thing I wanted to sort of raise is we've also recently started what we call a professionalization workshop. 
Um, and I believe, Dr. Peterson, we may be asking you for some money to help pay for pizza for this. So hopefully you're being moved by this. Uh, <laughs> um, but while it's not explicitly in the classroom, uh, it's in its second year. And it's for all students in our Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies. And it's giving them access to thinking about the skills, the experiences, and knowledge that they want to develop here while they're students at MTSU that are going to equip them moving forward. And so we've divided it into academic or professional educational goals, uh, career-based goals, and then community engagement goals. And these are some of the flyers for that that you can see. Um, and then we do six of them every year, so three per semester. So the pizza would be that expensive. Um, <laughs> and any, if students attend at least four of the workshops, we give them a certificate of completion, which, as one of my favorite students says, you can put that on your resume. Exactly. So, thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for staying a few minutes over. Um, because we are over time, I think we'll, if there are questions, we can just handle that on a one-on-one -on -one basis with the panelists if they have questions. So, uh, thanks, everybody.